Hi everyone, my name is Shelby. I am one of the current first year ambulatory care pharmacy residents at Moses Cone, and I'll be talking about the management of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. COPD is a common preventable and treatable disease that is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation that is due to airway and or alveolar abnormalities which is usually caused by a significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. COPD is the third leading cause of death in the world as of 2020, and more than 3 million people have died of COPD in 2012. It is also the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Some common risk factors, the first one people usually think about is tobacco smoking. Um, which is a risk factor. However, there are additional ones, including environmental chemical exposures, such as things like biomass fuel, air pollution, as well as genetic factors. There is a hereditary deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin, or AATD, which can lead to a decline in lung function or increase the risk of COPD. Female sex also increases the risk of COPD as well as having asthma may be a risk factor for the development of airflow limitation and COPD. So this slide reviews the mechanisms related to developing COPD. COPD is actually an umbrella term for both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Patients with COPD may have one or both. The cycle starts by initial tissue irritation and destruction due to risk factors mentioned in the prior slide, like smoking. This then leads to inflammation as seen on the left box. Inflammation leads to excess mucus production, which causes airway damage and constriction of the bronchioles, thus airway restriction, also called chronic bronchitis. This is the obstruction that is referred to in the name COPD. Next, airway restriction leads to lung parenchyma destruction, which is on the box on the right. This leads to decreased alveolar attachments and decreased elastic recoil, which is called emphysema. The decreased alveolar attachments causes a smaller total large surface area, and thus the lungs do not exchange oxygen as well compared to healthy lungs. Decreased elastic recoil leads to air trapping and difficulty inhaling and exhaling air as well. Although both COPD and asthma are both associated with chronic inflammation of the respiratory tract, there are differences in the inflammatory cells and mediators involved in these two diseases. COPD inflammation is neutrophil driven, which means it is resistant to anti-inflammatory effects of some medications like inhaled corticosteroids, which drives the treatment options for COPD compared to asthma, which we will talk about in detail later in this slide set. So this flowchart is from the gold guidelines, which is the guidelines for COPD assessment and treatment. The etiology starting at the top explains some of those risk factors that we just went over, such as smoking. Most patients with COPD will have had some kind of exposure or have been a smoker, current smoker, or if not, exposed to some type of pollutant or other host factors. This will lead to things like impaired lung growth, accelerated decline in lung function, lung injury, and or lung and systemic inflammation. This then leads to those physiological changes that we discussed on the prior slide, including airflow limitation, as well as things like emphysema and clinical manifestations, including symptoms, increases in exacerbations, and leading to other comorbidities. The clinical manifestations for COPD will be the things that you're looking for when assessing a patient, including symptoms like dyspnea, cough, sputum production, wheezing, and chest tightness. Patients will also be at risk for having COPD exacerbations and increased risk of morbidity and mortality. This chart from the gold guidelines goes over key indicators for considering a diagnosis of COPD. 
Ultimately, you will need to perform spirometry in order to confirm a diagnosis, um, but these factors give you a good idea of potentially whether or not the patient may have COPD. You should be asking your patients things to assess these different factors. Um, for example, dyspnea, is it progressive over time? Is it worse with exercise? Is it persistent? Um, most notably in comparison to asthma and your potential other differential diagnoses, it's helpful to know these details in order to assess whether or not you should be performing spirometry. Some other things would be asking about the characteristics of their chronic cough, their speed and production, their history of lower respiratory tract infections, assessing for environmental and family histories, exposures to different risk factors and other childhood factors that may put them at a higher risk of COPD and making that diagnosis more likely. One of the common symptoms for COPD is a chronic cough. However, there can be other causes, of course, that are not COPD, and these are some things listed here from the guidelines that you should take into consideration in your differential diagnosis when working at patients with a chronic cough, as it may not necessarily always be COPD. Here they list both intrathoracic and extrathoracic causes that may be leading to a chronic cough that are not necessarily COPD. In addition to that, um, here's a useful list of potential differential diagnoses of COPD. Most notably, one that is commonly compared is asthma compared to COPD. With COPD, it's more commonly having an onset in midlife, whereas asthma is earlier in life, often in childhood. Although patients may present with asthma later in life, and patients with COPD and many risk factors may present earlier if they've had earlier exposure to these risk factors. COPD symptoms slowly progress over time and they do not get better or worse um, and reverse in any way. It's a progressive disease, hence the acronym. Whereas Asthma vary widely from day to day due to different exposures, often having symptoms worse during different times of the day, especially at night or in early morning. Patients with asthma most commonly also have allergies, rhinitis, and or eczema, and may have a family history of asthma, and may also have a coexistence of obesity. Whereas in COPD patients, you're more commonly looking for that history of tobacco smoking or other exposures to other types of smoke. However, it is possible to develop COPD without ever smoking or being exposed specifically to tobacco smoking. But if that is the case, it's important to look for some of those other risk factors that we reviewed. Some other diagnoses in your differential could include congestive heart failure, bronchiectasis, tuberculosis, obliterative bronchiolitis, and diffuse panbronchiolitis. So the method for specifically diagnosing COPD should be considered in any patient with complaints of dyspnea, chronic cough, or sputum production, a history of recurrent lower respiratory tract infections, or a history of exposure to risk factors for the disease. If you think that your patient may have COPD, the next step would be to perform a spirometry, which is required for diagnosis. Once symptoms and risk factors are evaluated and COPD is suspected, spirometry should be performed. Spirometry is non-invasive, however, it may be difficult for many of these patients given their airflow limitation. A spirometer example is pictured on this slide. It is a device that is calibrated according to age, sex, height, and race. It measures the level of airflow limitation, the main components being FVC, or forced vital capacity, and FEV1, which is forced expiratory volume in one second. When you conduct spirometry for your patient, you'll first enter their information as directed into the device. When the device is ready, the patient should inhale a deep breath, then exhale through the mouthpiece, which is the pictured white tube coming out from the device in the photo. The correct technique is to blow as hard, as fast as they can, and then continue exhaling until they can no longer, or the device tells them to stop. 
most patients require coaching to perform this correctly. So be prepared to cheer them on and tell them to keep blowing, keep blowing until they can't anymore. The device will prompt multiple attempts and take the best attempt overall. Then the patient will receive bronchodilator, either 400 micrograms of Asaba, 160 micrograms of Asama, or the two combined. Give the patient time to inhale this treatment therapy. And then after, you can repeat the spirometry about 10 to 15 minutes after Asaba is given. And then the device will know that this is a post-bronchodilation test. The device after the second test is done, we'll print out the results of both the pre and post test. A COPD diagnosis is then analyzed from this information and will be indicated from the FEV1 over FVC after bronchodilator, and that number should be less than 0.7 to confirm that the patient has COPD. If you've never seen spirometry performed before and you know that you will need to be performing this in your clinic setting in the future, I would highly suggest you look up some common videos on YouTube. There's a lot of great demonstrations from respiratory therapists and other healthcare professionals um, give you a good idea of what this looks like and also um, how to coach a patient to do this correctly. If a patient does not do this correctly, then you won't be given the correct information to get a diagnosis. So as I mentioned, after you complete the spirometry test, it will print off information with the data collected. It will also print off this graph, which is a great visualization of the patient's lung function. As you can see on the left is a normal spirometry result. And you can see that the patient here was able to exhale a large amount of volume in the initial first second, and they were able to exhale the full capacity of their lungs pretty early on, and then it plateaued around two, two and a half seconds. However, in the spirometry results on the right, showing obstructive disease, the patient is not able to exhale a large amount of volume in the first second, and it also takes them much longer to reach their full capacity exhaled at about four or five seconds. As you can see as well, their total volume capacity is much smaller at 3.2 liters compared to the five liters of the normal spirometry. Another COPD characteristic that is not as well represented on this slide, but we will go over in class, is the time spent exhaling the total air in the lungs. Remember that COPD patients have airway restriction and are not as easily able to exhale the air in their lungs. Thus, you will see the plateaued line continue much longer compared to someone without COPD who is able to exhale completely faster. So now we went over the diagnosis, which is the FEV1 over FVC of less than 0.7. Next, you will also use the spirometry results of the FEV1% percent predicted to classify the severity of airflow limitation in your patient. And in the gold guidelines, they give a great graph listed here of the different severity scores. So as you can see, if your patient has an FEV1 of greater than or equal to 80% predicted, then they would have a mild airflow limitation. However, if your patient has an FEV1 of, for example, 20% predicted, then they have a very severe airflow limitation. This is a good way to compare the severity of COPD in your patient compared to others. Remember that this FEV1 score is a percentage compared to normal volume for a person of the same gender, height, and age. Our FEV1 normally declines with age after around age 20. However, this more progressively declines in patients with COPD. As you can see in the key here for TR3 and TR4, both of these patients have COPD and so you can observe the rapid decline in the FEV1 over time compared to patients with normal lung function. When you do these spirometry tests, you will notice that patients with smaller lungs 
especially patients with just a smaller frame and having smaller lungs in general may not have as large of a FEV1 compared to others at their same age, et cetera. However, that does not necessarily mean that they have COPD and you would still go over the FEV1 over FVC diagnosis, um, but the spirometry device might indicate that they have less lung function compared to others at their age but it may just be due to their lung size. So I think this graph nicely highlights the difference between typical lungs and smaller lungs, but both of these TR1 and TR2 do not have COPD. So once your patient has an official diagnosis of COPD, you can use two different scoring tools to assess symptoms. The first is a COPD assessment test or CAT, and then the next is the Modified Medical Research Council or MMRC. Both of these scoring tools will be very important to continue to assess your patient and how well their COPD is managed. The CAT test looks at the impact of disease and burdens of daily symptoms and is scored from zero to 40. And the MMRC looks at the baseline symptoms due to respiratory disease and scores from zero to four. Here's an example of a CAT assessment. These are things that you can either have the patient fill out in the waiting room before you see them for your office visit or have them fill it out or go through it with them while you are interviewing them and assessing them for their COPD in clinic. For example, you can ask a patient on a scale of zero to five, zero being I never cough and five being I cough all the time, how would you score yourself? And kind of go through the list and then add up the total score to get your final results for the cat. The MMRC dyspnea scale is a lot shorter and can also be filled out prior to coming into the clinic visit and is given as a grade so the patient may be able to assess this themselves or during your interview after asking them questions you can also grade them on this scale as well. Grade four is indicating a patient is too breathless to leave the house or breathless when dressing or undressing. And then the severity score decreases based on how far the patient can walk or keep up with people of the same age or get short of breath when walking up on a level or walking up a slight hill, or if they only just get breathless with strenuous exercise. Next, we'll go into medication management and the different types of therapies available to patients with COPD. Once your patient is diagnosed with COPD, you can use the ABCD assessment tool. As you can see on the left, we've already discussed how to diagnose a patient using spirometry with the FEV1 over FEC less than 0.7. After that, we can assess their airflow limitation as we discussed using the FEV1% predicted to get a grade of one through four. And then next, we'll assess their symptoms and risks of exacerbation with the ABCD grade here. This is using, so on the bottom of this square, you can see using the symptom assessment tools that we just discussed of MMRC or CAT, and then on the left, assessing whether or not the patient has moderate or severe exacerbation history. So if they have not had any hospital admissions due to COPD exacerbations, then they would be on the bottom. And if they've had at least two or more exacerbations or at least one leading to a hospital admission, then they would be on the top here. So you would assess both their ex exacerbation history and their symptoms, and then put them in one of the boxes of A, B, C, or D. So the reason why it's important to identify which A, B, C, or D group the patient is in is to know what initial treatment would be appropriate for the patient. If the patient is identified to be in group A because they don't have very severe symptoms using those symptom tools and they don't have a severe history of exacerbations, then it's appropriate to start the patient on just a bronchodilator and no other inhaler therapies. 
If the patient is identified in group B, then it would be appropriate to start either a LABA or LAMA inhaler, which we'll go into more detail in the next coming slides. If the patient does not have very severe symptoms, but they do have a strong history of exacerbations, then it would be appropriate to start on a LAMA inhaler specifically, as LAMA inhalers have more benefit in COPD compared to LABA inhalers, and we'll discuss more of that as well. And then lastly, if you have a patient who is initially diagnosed um, and their symptoms are very severe and also have a severe history of exacerbations, then it would be appropriate to start them on either a LAMA, could consider combination therapy with a LAMA and LABA inhaler, or consider ICS with a LABA, only if indicated for patients that have eosinophil count greater than or equal to 300. Also, the guidelines note that combination therapy with a LAMA and LABA inhaler is considered if the patient is highly symptomatic, such as having a CAT score of greater than 20. The GOLD guidelines also give a follow-up pharmacological treatment flow sheet that should be used to adjust therapy for COBD patients that have already been diagnosed. As you can see, it's based on the predominant symptom of either dyspnea or exacerbations. These recommendations do not depend on what, which ABCD assessment was made at diagnosis and can be used to adjust therapy or even de-escalate therapy if needed. For example, if a patient has predominantly dyspnea symptoms, they are very short of breath and it's interfering with their activities of daily living. Um, they are already on one a LABA inhaler or LAMA inhaler. Then this flow sheet would indicate that the patient should be escalated to combination therapy of a LABA LAMA. As you can see here as well in the asterisk at the bottom, you can consider ICS therapy if a patient has an eosinophil count of greater than or equal to 300 or greater than or equal to 100 and two or more moderate exacerbations or one hospitalization. The reason why there are specific recommendations we'll go into more detail when we talk about ICS therapy in the following slides, but essentially ICS therapy has risks as well, so it's not blanket recommended for all patients as an option for escalation. It's also important to consider, as the flu sheet mentions here, is making sure that the patient is using their inhaler device correctly. If they potentially are having difficulties, even after educating them on how to use it, it could be considered to switch to an alternative inhaler with a different method um, that may be easier for the patient to use also should be investigating and treating other causes that may be um, giving the patient dyspnea. Alternatively, on the right for exacerbations, patient would be increased from just one LABA or LAMA inhaler to a combination and then assessing their eosinophil counts to consider ICS therapy. After all of this is used and the patient is still having exacerbations, you could consider reflumal Rifumilast or azithromycin in former smokers, and we'll go into this in more detail when we talk about these medications in the upcoming slides. Now we'll be going through the different types of medication classes. The first one I wanted to talk about is long-acting muscarinic antagonists or LAMAs. These work by blocking the bronchoconstrictor effects of acetylcholine on the M3 muscarinic receptors, which are expressed in airway smooth muscles, and this leads to a bronchodilator effect. Some of these last 24 hours, so they only need to be given once a day, whereas others last only 12 hours and would need to be given twice a day. The once a day options include teotropium, called Spiriva, comes as a handy healer or a respimat, Amechlidinium, which comes as Incruce Ellipta, Revifenacin, which comes as Upelri, a nebulizer, and then the twice a day options include Aclidinium, which comes as Two Doors of Press Air, and Glycopyrrolate, which comes as a Seabreed Neohaler, and Lonhala, which comes as a nebulizer. As you can see here, there's lots of different types of inhaler forms, so it's important to consider what forms your patient may be comfortable using, maybe a little bit easier for them to use one over the other. 
and also if they've used any in a different type of inhaler in the past. Also would consider what type of insurance they have and whether or not their formulary requires a specific type of inhaler, um, as sometimes they may require something preferred one over the other. Otherwise, these work equally as well. It just depends on whether or not the patient is able to use them correctly to get the benefit of the medication. Some side effects that would come from this medication would be things like dryness in the mouth. Um, patients may also report a bitter or metallic taste. These are poorly absorbed when they're inhaled, so we don't really see any systemic anticholinergic effects. Also, I won't be going through how to use these inhalers during this slideshow, as we'll be bringing demos to class and going over that with you in person. Um, but definitely, if you aren't familiar or haven't seen these before, it can be helpful to look online um, at some YouTube demonstrations or on the inhaler websites just to get familiar with how these different inhaler types work. The next class is called LABAs or Long-Acting Beta Agonists. And the way I think about this is if you're familiar with SABAs or short-acting beta agonists like albuterol, it's a common one that people think about as a rescue inhaler. Well, these are essentially the inhalers that last over a longer period of time throughout the day. Um, their specific mechanism is they're a B2 agonist, which essentially relaxes the airway smooth muscles by stimulating the beta 2 adrenergic receptors. This then leads to an increase in cyclic AMP and produces functional antagonism, which leads to which blocks bronchoconstriction. So essentially helping to open the airways to make it a little bit easier to breathe. Compared to uh, Saba inhalers like albuterol, which usually wear off within four to six hours, these can last 12 to 24 hours. Similar to llamas, the dosing is based off of how long they last. Once daily inhalers include indactorol or arcapta neohaler, olodaterol or striverity respimat, volantorol ellipta, which is only in combination with amyclidinium as enoro or fluticasone as brio. And then twice daily inhalers include salmeterol or the severant discus, formoterol or performist nebulizer, and aframoterol or bravana nebulizer. Since these can stimulate the receptors, they can cause some tachycardia in patients um, and they may be observing this or they may not really notice that at all. So as you can recall in the stepwise increase in therapy from the guidelines, after a patient has been on either a LABA or LAMA inhaler, or if they have significant symptoms, then it may be appropriate to increase them to a combination therapy. The nice part about this is it comes in one inhaler, whereas the patient wouldn't have to use two different inhalers at one time. Lama laba combinations come as umeclidinium and volantorol, which is called a noro ellipta, teotropium and olodaterol, which comes as steelto respimat, indactorol with glycopyrrolate, which comes as itrobron neohaler, and acladinium with fermoterol, which comes as daclear press air, and glycopyrrolate with fermoterol, which comes as bevepsi aerosphere. It's important to consider too, as I already mentioned, what types of inhalers patients have already used before. So when possible, if they already feel comfortable, for example, with using the raspamat for spiriva, then it would be more appropriate if possible to advance them to the steel till respimat if you're increasing it to a combination therapy. However, if that's not an option based on cost, insurance, or other reasons, it's still appropriate to use any of these options as a combination therapy if needed. We also have SAMA and SABA combination inhalers, which includes ipratropium with albuterol, which is a com called Combivent respimat inhaler and then ipratropium with albuterol as a duoneb nebulizer. Inhaled corticosteroids, or ICS, provide anti-inflammatory effects on the airways. These may be considered in some cases for COPD patients that continue to have exacerbations and a lot of symptoms, despite being on lava-lama therapy, as we discussed earlier. 
However, ICS therapy is not routinely recommended for all COPD patients, and this is mainly due to an increased risk of pneumonia, which has been confirmed even at low doses of ICS therapy. This risk is higher in certain patient populations, including current smokers, those over 55 years old, those with a BMI of less than 25, or patients with a history of exacerbations or a history of pneumonia. Patients that have those risk factors should be considered use of ICS a little bit more cautiously, if not completely indicated. When ICS therapy is indicated, ICS combination with a LABA inhaler is more effective than either component alone in improving lung function and reducing exacerbations, but it does not have any difference in mortality outcomes for COPD. So when should you use ICS therapy? I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just to revisit that, it should be considered in patients that have greater than or equal to two exacerbations of COPD per year and an eosinophil count of greater than 300. Also would benefit patients that also have a history of asthma as ICS therapy is a mainstay of treatment for asthma. And patients may have both asthma and COPD. You may consider ICS therapy in patients that have one moderate exacerbation of COPD in a year and or eosinophil counts of um, intermediate range of 100 to 300. However, you should not be using ICS therapy if patients have an eosinophil count less than 100 or if they've had repeated pneumonia events or any history of mycobacterial infection. Some other side effects other than that pneumonia risk from ICS therapy include oral candidiasis and a hoarse voice. An important counseling point for any inhaler that includes ICS is the patient must rinse and spit after taking the inhaler to prevent that oral thrush side effect. A good tip I like to tell patients if they're forgetting to do this is to try to take their inhaler right before they brush their teeth, either um, depending on most of these are twice a day, so it works out pretty well brushing your teeth in the morning at night. And then if they brush their teeth right after, then they should be fine. Otherwise, if they're out and about and they don't have access to that, they can still just rinse their mouth and gargle and spit and that should be adequate. So as you can see here, I've listed the ICS monotherapy inhalers and the ICS combination inhalers with a LABA. It's important to note again that ICS therapy should never be used alone in COPD because of that risk of pneumonia. And there really is not benefit or indication to be using just an ICS inhaler for COPD patients. For ICS inhalers alone, you could consider using these if a patient is already using a LABA or LAMA inhaler and you just want to add it on, um, depending on what the patient's preference is or cost, things like that. ICS inhalers listed here are fluticasone, which comes as Flovent, aerosol, or discus, and Arnuity ellipta. Arnuity is the only one that is actually once daily, otherwise the rest are twice a day. Beclomethazone comes as QVAR aerosol. Budesonide comes as Pulmacort, which is a dry powder or a nebulizer. And Mometazone, which comes as Asmonex dry powder. For combinations of ICS with LABA, all of these are twice a day dosing except for the Brio Ellipta inhaler. Fluticasone with Salmeterol comes as Advair aerosol or discus dry powder and HFA inhaler and also as the Air Duo Respiclic. Fluticasone with Volantarol comes as the Brio Dry Powder Ellipta, and Budesonide with Fermoterol comes as Simbacort Aerosol, and Mometazone with Fermoterol comes as Dulera Aerosol. Advair as Fluticasone with Salmeterol recently became available as generic called Wixella, which is cheaper but still pricey at around $100 compared to $300 for the brand. However, Air Duo Respiclic more recently also became generic and is available for $38 at CVS using a GoodRx coupon. So this is a great option for patients that otherwise would not be able to afford these inhalers due to cost.
Lastly, we have triple therapy inhalers or inhalers that have a combination of a lava, llama, and ICS therapy. We have two different options. The first one that came out on the market is called Trilogy Ellipta, which is a dry powder inhaler. And this includes the Laba Volanterol, the Lama Umeclidinium, and the ICS Fluticasone. And then more recently on the market is Brez Tree Aerosphere, which is a metered dose inhaler. And the Laba is Formoterol, Lama is Glycopyrrolate, and the ICS is Budesonide. Triple therapy has been shown to improve lung function, patient reported outcomes, and reduce exacerbations when compared to LAMA, lava lama combinations and ICS lava combinations. Newer data in 2021 that was recently added to the gold guidelines now also show that triple therapy may have a beneficial effect on mortality in symptomatic patients with a history of frequent and or severe exacerbations. Despite this, um, we still need more data to clearly show whether or not there's a benefit on mortality. However, it's important to consider for triple therapy when indicated in patients that are still having exacerbations or symptoms despite being on a lava llama therapy. Also important to consider again, that if a patient is on a prior combination therapy or different types of lava llama inhalers, you don't have to switch them to one of these that has the same ingredients as it's still effective. Um, so for example, if they're on a different type of an inhaler combination, lava llama, it's okay if the lava is not Valanterol and the lava is not Umeclidinium. Um, so just increasing patients to triple therapy when indicated. And then if patients are improving and they're no longer having exacerbations or symptoms, because of that risk of having an ICS therapy increasing risk of pneumonia, may be considered to step down the therapy back to just a combination without the inhaled corticosteroids when indicated. So this is another great slide from the gold guidelines that just reiterates what I had previously said on the slide, reviewing ICS therapies and when to consider adding on an ICS therapy for COPD patients. And mostly the biggest factors are whether or not they've had increased exacerbations, are uncontrolled, what their blood eosinophil count is, and whether or not they have, uh, in addition to COPD, also having asthma. Also important to note that prior to increasing any type of therapy, as I have mentioned before, is to make sure your patients are using their inhalers properly because they may not be using it properly and thus having persistent symptoms or exacerbations when in reality, they just need to have a little bit more counseling or assistance in how to use the inhaler rather than stepping up the therapy. So that should be something that's assessed at each step before you increase your therapy for these patients. Back to this follow-up treatment algorithm, now that we've talked about the different types of inhalers, LAVAs, LAMAs, and ICS therapy, you can see on the right with exacerbations, there's also these other medications that can be considered after you have exhausted the inhaler options. So we'll be talking about that on the next slide. These other therapies are listed here on this slide, the first being reflumolast. This is a PDE4 inhibitor and can be considered after triple therapy if FEV1 is less than 50% and the patient has chronic bronchitis. This may decrease the number of sputum neutrophils and eosinophils and would be a good therapy choice for patients that have a predominant chronic bronchitis subtype and a chronic productive cough. Unfortunately, it's often limited by its side effects, which include weight loss, sleep disorders, headaches, diarrhea, and nausea. The next is azithromycin at 250 milligrams a day or 500 milligrams three times a week, or erythromycin at 500 milligrams two times per day. And this would be used over one year and has been shown to reduce the risk of exacerbations compared to usual care. 
This is only recommended for patients that are non-smokers due to a post hoc analysis that suggested lesser benefit in active smokers. Unfortunately, this has been shown that azithromycin use was associated with an increased incidence of bacterial resistance and impaired hearing tests. So something to consider when weighing the benefits over the risks for using this therapy for a year. Next is these mucolytic and antioxidant agents, including erdocysteine, carbocysteine, and N-acetylcysteine. These are available over the counter and can be useful in reducing the risk of exacerbations, mainly in patients that have a lot of sputum production by helping to break up that phlegm and make it a little bit easier for patients to um, get rid of that phlegm and also breathe easier. In COPD patients that are not receiving inhaled corticosteroids, therapy has, these therapies have been shown to reduce exacerbations and modestly improve health status. Next is aminoophilin and theophylin. These are mexyl anthenines. Theophylline has a small bronchodilator bronchodilator effect in stable COPD that can cause modest symptom benefit. However, theophylline is no longer recommended due to its side effect profile, and although it may improve FEV1, it has contradictory evidence for reducing exacerbations and is not recommended. And lastly, for patients that do have a documented alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, as mentioned in the beginning of the slideshow with that hereditary factor, it may be beneficial for those patients to receive specific therapy for that deficiency. So after a patient has been initiated on COPD therapy, then it's important to follow up and reevaluate their current therapy. Reevaluation would include assessing their symptoms, exacerbation histories, whether or not they're using the inhaler appropriately based on how often they're using it, how many inhalations, and the actual way that they're using the inhaler, whether or not they're inhaling appropriately or um, using, preparing the inhaler, priming it, etc. You may consider escalation, de-escalation, and changing any inhalers a patient is on depending on your assessment during follow-up. The GOLD guidelines give a great overview of the management of COPD, starting from diagnosis, looking at symptoms, risk factors, and then performing the spirometry to confirm diagnosis, as we discussed and then going into the initial assessment of that chart with the GOLD assessment of how severe their airflow limitation is based on the FEV1, as well as the ABCD chart based on symptoms and exacerbation history, as well as considering assessment for alpha-1 antitrypsin, assessing their smoking status and comorbidities. And then initial management, all Although we're also following ABCD, there's other things to consider, such as, of course, providing smoking cessation um, assistance, providing them the correct va vaccinations if indicated, active lifestyle and exercise to improve symptoms, and self-management education, including understanding what their risk factors are, inhaler technique, what breathlessness management would be, and a written action plan, and then managing any additional comorbidities. At follow-ups, you would be reviewing symptoms, exacerbations, their smoking status, exposure to risk factors, inhaler technique, and the others listed here um, that we already reviewed. Patients may also need their pharmacotherapy adjusted as well as non-pharmacological therapy options discussed. The overall goal for your patients would be to reduce their symptoms and then reduce the risk of progressing in their COPD. It's important to remember that COPD is not something that you can cure, but it's something that you can manage and prevent further progression, which is really important for quality of life, morbidity, and mortality. For symptoms, it's important to be able to relieve symptoms, improve patients' exercise tolerance, and thus help improve their overall health status. 
And then reducing their risk would be to prevent disease progression, prevent and treat any exacerbations, and reducing mortality. I mentioned non-pharmacological management of COPD, which is also very important. For all patient groups, A, B, C, or D, smoking cessation is very important, and this can have a huge impact on whether or not their COPD progresses further or whether or not it's able to be managed. So this can include pharmacological treatment to help assist them in smoking cessation if they're ready and interested, um, and something that you should be asking them at every follow-up visit if they still smoke. In addition to smoking cessation, physical activity is recommended for all patients, as well as vaccinations, including flu, pneumococcal, pertussis, and COVID-19 vaccinations. When you get into the B, C, and D group, patients may benefit from specific pulmonary re rehabilitation programs, which help assist patients in developing an exercise routine that they actually are able to perform, as Many times patients with more severe airflow limitations may struggle with performing physical activity. As mentioned, the gold guidelines do give recommendations for vaccinations for COPD patients. This goes into a little bit more detail about that. For influenza vaccinations, it can reduce serious illness and death and is recommended for all patients. The WHO and CDC recommend the COVID-19 vaccination for people with COPD, as well as the PPSV23 pneumococcal vaccine, which has been shown to reduce the incidence of community-acquired pneumonia in COPD patients that are less than 65, with an FEV1 of less than 40% predicted, and in those with comorbidities. In the general population, greater than or equal to 60, 65 years old, the PCV13 has shown significant efficacy in reducing bacteremia and serious invasive pneumococcal disease. The new ACIP recommendations for the PCV13 vaccine has changed and the decision is now based on a clinical judgment and a discussion with the patient. So the gold guidelines are essentially agreeing with that recommendation and giving evidence as to when it may be beneficial for patients who may be at higher risk. The CDC recommends Tdap vaccination to prevent against pertussis for adults with COPD who were not vaccinated in their adolescence and zoster vaccine to prevent against shingles once uh, COPD patients reach the age of 50 or older, um, similar to the recommendations for the general public. So not much is new here, um, but just a good reminder as to the benefits of this va these vaccinations, as well as making sure that you're screening for things like this when you are seeing a patient for the first time, as well as follow-ups if it hasn't been address addressed previously. So there are many different types of inhalers, ones that require a patient to breathe in quickly and deeply for drug powdered inhalers as compared to having the coordination and timing to use metered dose inhalers. And we'll go over how to counsel patients over these different types of inhalers in class. However, I wanted to make a note about the importance of whether or not a patient is actually able to use different types of inhalers. Most notably is the dry powdered inhaler, which requires a patient to inhale quickly and strongly in order for the powder to actually go into their lungs in the proper way. So in order to measure this, you can actually test a peak inspiratory flow rate with a device such as an in-check dial. And this makes sure that the patient has the ability to use this type of inhaler. Uh, commonly with COPD patients, they may not have the ability to inhale or exhale quickly like that, as we had seen in the spirometry results previously in the slide set. So many patients, although the medication may be correct, they may not actually have the strength to use that type of inhaler and a metered dose inhaler would be more appropriate. It's always important to be sure that you're checking that patient is using their inhaler correctly and rechecking that when you continue to see patients in follow-up visits. 
Things like a spacer can be considered if patients have difficulty coordinating the steps with a metered dose inhaler, and some patients may benefit from a nebulizer treatment as well. The last topic I wanted to touch on is COPD exacerbations. This is important to know because you may need to differentiate whether a patient is having an exacerbation as well as if they're appropriate for outpatient or inpatient therapy. Symptoms of an exacerbation include increased dyspnea, increased sputum, purulence, and volume, increased cough, and wheezing. Differential diagnoses include pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure, and cardiac arrhythmia. Frequent exacerbations of greater than two times per year increase morbidity for COPD patients, so it's important to be following as much as we can evidence-based guidelines and therapies like we've discussed to help reduce the risk of exacerbations. The causes of exacerbations most frequently are due to a viral upper respiratory tract infection and can also be caused by different types of bacterial infections. The goal of exacerbation treatment is to reduce the negative impact of the current exacerbation and then prevent future exacerbations. More than 80% of exacerbations are managed in the outpatient setting. And depending on the severity of the exacerbation and other patient-specific factors and circumstances, hospitalization may be indicated, such as for patients who have frequent exacerbations, significant comorbid conditions, or they can't be managed as easily in the outpatient setting. A worsening of clinical status, including the development of like new physical signs or pronounced increase in symptom intensity may also warrant hospitalization or at least a visit to the emergency room for consideration of admission. Treatments for outpatient management include Saba Sama therapy, steroids, and antibiotics. For all patients, they should receive high doses of Saba plus or minus Sama and this will benefit them more immediately than their maintenance inhalers. And given that their maintenance inhalers like a LAMA or LABA act in a similar way, they may increase the risk of side effects when used together with the high doses of the short-acting therapies. So this is something that just depends on patient-specific factors and whether or not you'd want them to continue their maintenance inhalers or resume them after the high doses of the SABA therapy is complete. However, it should be resumed whenever, as soon as possible, so that patients continue to receive benefit from managing their day-to-day -day symptoms and preventing any further exacerbations or disease progression. Corticosteroids can improve lung function, oxygenation, and shorten recovery time and hospitalization duration if a patient is admitted. Corticosteroids can be considered for patients that are experiencing an exacerbation, and the typical dose recommended is prednisone 40 milligrams daily or equivalent for no more than five to seven days. This duration of therapy is based on systematic reviews that found extending the duration to up to 14 days did not provide any additional benefit, and this way patients have less of an exposure to steroids with this shorter duration of therapy. And lastly, antibiotics can shorten recovery time, reduce risk of early relapse, treatment failure, and hospitalization duration. The duration of therapy for antibiotics should also not be more than five to seven days and should be considered for patients if they're having increased dyspnea, sputum, sputum volume, and sputum purulence, or can be considered if a patient has sputum purulence and what, one other symptom. For antibiotic drug selection, you should be targeting typical respiratory pathogens that you're anticipating, as well as considering any local resistance patterns. One really useful thing to provide patients is a COPD action plan for how to manage exacerbations when they occur. Oftentimes, patients may have exacerbations and may not seek out care right away. So it's important for patients to understand what type of symptoms to look out for and whether or not that might be an exacerbation that warrants treatment. 
So as you can see here, this is just an example I took from online. There's lots of different um, action plan templates that you can use depending on what your preference is, but you would help fill this out for the patient when you see them for either an initial or follow-up visit and go through the different zones. So green zone is their symptoms are managed well, they're not having any complaints, they continue to take their maintenance inhalers daily. In the yellow zone, they're experiencing some of those exacerbation symptoms, and this is where you would counsel them on what to do, whether or not to continue their daily medications, to use quick reliever inhalers like a Saba, like their albuterol, and for how many hours, as well as giving them a prescription for prednisone that they can fill if they are experiencing an exacerbation and potentially an antibiotic if they're at high risk for exacerbations and anticipate them needing an antibiotic. But it's important to be able to counsel patients on when it's appropriate to use these things and whether or not um, they should start that. If they do go into the yellow zone, they should be contacting their provider to let them know um, so that any follow-up can be arranged. But this way, this helps to avoid any delays in care since starting things like the steroid can help manage the exacerbation rather than delaying the care over multiple days. And then the red zone would go over some more severe symptoms where a patient would need immediate medical attention um, and likely hospitalization due to a more severe exacerbation. The majority of this presentation was referencing the gold guidelines for COPD. I have listed some other guidelines available for your reference here that may be useful when you're looking at some more of those gray areas in the management of COPD. I also wanted to mention as well that the Gold Guidelines website is really useful. Um, a lot of the handouts or charts that I provided in the slideshow were directly from the guidelines, and you're able to access this freely um, to anybody who wants to read it. They also do have a pocket guide, which is a shorter version of the full guidelines. And every year when they update it, which is updated annually, they do include a short PowerPoint or PDF that goes over what was updated in each section of the guidelines, as well as why it was updated. So based on new evidence or literature and things like that. So I find that super helpful and something to consider referencing as you enter into your clinical practice in the future, since things like this and guidelines can definitely change over time. I appreciate your time and attention listening to this presentation. I hope it was helpful in better understanding COPD, and I look forward to our time in class together.